Hi everyone, uh, it's Katie here from e for d I see some comments. Um, we do have all the participants muted so that it'll just be myself and Jeremiah, our presenter today, who can speak just so that things don't get um, too, too out of hand with 30 people talking um, or likely even more as people keep joining. So we do have you muted, but you can uh, message each other in the chat that I see you guys are already exploring. Um, and it is two o'clock, so I think we'll actually get started. Um, as I said, I'm Katie Gibbs, I'm the Executive Director here at Evidence for Democracy. And I'm delighted to introduce Jeremiah Yarmi, who's going to be um, presenting the webinar today. We had the pleasure of having Jeremiah as a intern with us for the summer. Um, and he is a graduate of the science communication program at Laurentian. And he did a science communication 101 talk a few weeks ago. And it was actually, I think, our most well attended talk yet. So we got a lot of really excellent feedback on that. So we decided to bring him back to do the next, um, the next in that series of webinars. So today he's going to dive a little bit deeper into science communication and storytelling. So with that, I will hand it over to Jeremiah. Great. Thanks, Katie. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say hi to everyone, make sure everyone can hear me. So um, I know that you've been exploring the chat function so far on Zoom. If this is your first time using Zoom, you can chat and talk with everyone attending here right now, all 46 of us, and also wave, although I probably won't be pairing uh, paying it that much attention to the waves, but you can, you know, it's fun to put your little hand up and, and note to everyone else here that you are in attendance and that you are enjoying the webinar. So we're going to be get, we're going to start um, in on science communication 102, science and storytelling. Today we're really going to talk about how storytelling can be used in the communication of science, the different ways you can tell stories, and uh, the, the really just the myriad of storytelling in general. There is so many different structures that you can use, so many different approaches that you can use when you're doing storytelling, and we'll kind of touch on a lot of that. So yeah, so just before we get started, uh, like Katie mentioned, I am a graduate. Well, I'm convocating this week, apparently. Uh, from Laurentian's science communication program. It's the only master's program of its kind in Canada. I uh, will not be in attendance at the convocation in Sudbury, but I will be receiving my diploma soon, so that's very cool. I come from a background in science. I have a genetics and biochemistry degree from the University of Manitoba, uh, but I've also always done a lot of performance art, uh, particularly theater and even more so in. Uh, Improv. Uh, improv often seen as a comedy sort of uh, field of theater. It's also really good for getting a really fundamental understanding of storytelling and how stories can be structured and used in so many different ways. Uh, and this is a picture of me. So today we're going to be talking about storytelling. It's really the art of crafting and sharing narratives. Uh, it's an ancient skill. It's a skill that's been integrally linked with our species, found throughout society since time immemorial. I mean, that makes sense. We often needed ways to entertain ourselves and stories is a really great way to do that. And even as we are in this digital age, we still turn to stories to entertain us and to guide us and help us make sense of the world. Um, scientists may be adept at presentations and reporting on results, but storytelling might be a different skill than presenting and reporting. And it may be untapped in uh, the repertoire of a scientist, or at least uh, underdeveloped when it comes to actually crafting intriguing and engaging stories. So uh, as we move on, why narratives? So this is a question for the chat. Uh, what can narratives be used for? So just share in the chat, what do you think storytelling is good for? What can it be used for? Why do we do it? 
Uh, and any answers are great. You can shout them out. Uh, there's no wrong answers here. We're just brainstorming, explaining what things mean, not just what they are, passing on information, give context, hook to your findings. For sure, context is really key, and we'll get that. We'll get into that in a little bit. But um, yeah, there's some good ones. Anyone else? Giving an opportunity for people to relate. Yeah, exactly. Storytelling really, as we were mentioning context before, it, it's a way to get people to relate their own personal experiences with whatever you're uh, storytelling about, whatever the narrative is about and entails. Any other uh, thoughts before we move on? Provides a lens and a perspective. Yeah, so storytelling is really interesting in that you're not only um, giving a selection of the a selection of the the world but you're also deflecting of the world too right you can only see a specific amount when you're telling a story and you're omitting things and you might not be doing that on purpose but the omission is also really important when it comes to the the overall narrative that you're presenting so i have some other ones here on the slide that we're going to go over so Narratives can be used to unite individuals together, often people that are working towards a similar cause, a, a goal in mind, um, can be really tied together through the use of narrative. If you think about, you know, thinking of, of we are the, the, the heroes, the protagonists of this story, and there are villains, and we have to overcome the challenges that the villains place in front of us, that's a great way of, of really uniting people together for a common goal. As I mentioned before, narratives can also be used to entertain us. Uh, I mean, storytelling is fun to do and it's fun to hear, especially when the story is really good. Uh, and moving people emotionally. So uh, storytelling is a really great way of, of getting to that emotional, feelings-based area in each of us. Uh, stories can really move us. I mean, I can't think of how many books and movies and music albums I've cried to. Stories have a way of really just finding uh, the humanity in us. And that's, that's really important. And that's really something to consider when you're communicating science is how you can move people emotionally as well. So uh, storytelling, is it more effective? The results are in, and yes, it is. Uh, science communication utilizing narratives are more engaging and efficient. Uh, but what does that mean? Uh, narratives really engage individuals, uh, making them motivated when they're listening to your science communication. They have purpose. They're, they're trying to figure things out for themselves, filling in holes themselves. They're engaged. Mentally, their cognitive load increases, they're trying to figure out things and contextualize things, often based on their own experiences, uh, and forming memories. Uh, and studies have shown that narrative-driven science communication results in better recall and comprehension in your audiences. And if your goal of communicating science is for your audience to at least be familiar with or remember what you are communicating, then narrative's a great way to do that and you should try it out. As we covered in Science Communication 101, and as the chat mentioned previously, good science communication often considers the context of the audience and the communication act within itself. So, you know, who are you talking to? Is it a room full of professors? Is it a room full of early stage researchers? Is it a room full of undergrads? Uh, did they just have lunch? Are they sleepy because they want to have a nap after that lunch? Is the room hot? Is it cold? Is it dimly lit? All of these factors, is it the day after daylight saving switches? All of these factors are things you have to consider when you're crafting a science communication piece, an act of science communication. Uh, and that context is really important. Storytelling is cool, though, that in that you get to also create context. Storytelling is about creating and transporting your audience. You get to establish context based on how you structure the story and how you establish it. Through exposition and plot, you can set up context yourself. And 
uh, that's really interesting because it really shows the power of storytelling. You can help lead people towards specific trains of thought and ways of viewing the story, viewing the science that you're communicating about through the structure of your story. And we'll get a little bit into that now. So storytelling follows cause and effect relationships. Um, and often narratives help point the audience towards connections and conclusions. Because narratives point to connections more than empirical truths, so when you're telling a story, you're often showing similarities or the way through which things relate to each other rather than um, the truth itself, which would be, you know, evidence-based research and uh, scientific results, th that sort of thing. Um, narratives don't necessarily uh, point towards those truths, those logical truths. Often they, they can be a little bit more uh, fuzzy and a little bit more based on anecdotes and, and making assumptions. So it's important that when you're using narratives in science communication that you are careful and that um, you try to always make sure that the connections that you are alluding to and the relationships, the cause and effect relationships that you're uh, establishing without the structure of your story are, are really pointing the audience towards the truth supported by, you know, your research practice and the scientific consensus. Uh, and so good science communication really uses this uh, subjective strength of narrative with the integrity and ethics and objective strength of good science. And so they, use, they are used together in order to have a really strong effect. And so, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, narratives are persuasive. They lead people towards conclusions. And so that means you have to be a good science communicator. You have to be uh, benevolent. Um, you have to care about your audience's success and you have to be on their side the entire way because you're really guiding them along a path. And if they stray from that path and make conclusions that aren't true and aren't based in science and evidence, that's uh, your fault as the guide and you have to wrangle them back onto the path and make sure that they're making the right conclusions and they're making the right connections. So uh, you care about their success, which is also your success as a communicator. You wanna make sure that they take away from your story what you intended for them to take away. And that requires you to establish clear goals when you're communicating science. So whenever you are doing an act of science communication, you should uh, establish some clear goals for yourself and always be striving to uh, reach those goals and also check in with your audience after to make sure that um, they, the, the goal has been, you know, uh, achieved in those people. Um, science communication isn't a one-way street. It, it's a conversation. It's interacting with your audience. It's having a back and forth and, and growing and learning as much as teaching and communicating. So keep that in mind. So stories are not straightforward. Um, narratives really create implicit meanings rather than explicit ones. So like I mentioned before, your audience is really jumping to conclusions and making assumptions. You're asking your audience to fill in the gaps themselves. And often the meaning that they derive from these gaps are based on their own personal experiences, their feelings, their values, their morals, their, their background, where they come from, their views, all of those things. Uh, and a really great part of storytelling is letting your audience fill in these holes. And so it's important that you structure your story such that it's not either on one side uh, condescending and too overbearing in the message. If it's very obvious the entire time, your audience will feel patronized and bored because it's not engaging. But if it's too ambiguous and esoteric and it's, you know, as complicated as Twin Peaks or any other David Lynch project uh, and ambiguous and esoteric, they're, they're also not going to enjoy it because, uh, especially in the act of science communication, uh, that's, that's not fun. You, you need to find that good balance and that's really important. So 
um, filling in holes is really great, but you have to make sure that it's not done heavy handedly on both sides of the spectrum. So why should emotions be important? Narratives are really good at eliciting emotional and personal reactions in audiences. Uh, and engaging emotions can result in what's known as transportation, where you effectively transport the individual, your audience, so that they are completely invested emotionally and cognitively in your story. They are effectively somewhere else. They are with you on that story, on that adventure, on that narrative, on that journey. Uh, and when they're in that space, they're most susceptible to, you know, big science communication wins and gains. You, you really have them, you can get them on your side. And that requires, you know, making them laugh, making them cry, making them cringe, making them root for you and for the science, all of, all of the things that you can think of from, you know, traditional storytelling from movies, all of those tropes and ideas can be, can be used to transport your audience. And, and that's really great for science communication because if you, can, if you can get someone on your side from the beginning, then it's a lot easier when, you know, they come up to more resistance when, when things may maybe conflict with their values and their beliefs. If they're already with you, then they'll be more willing to listen to you and give you a chance if, if that's the case. So, um, narratives aren't really prescriptive, and we can only really talk about generalities and tropes when we discuss the structure of a story. Uh, general traits are shared throughout a lot of stories, and that's because. Um, those similarities are really rooted in the way our brains work and the way we enjoy stories and all those things. So here's another question for the chat. What is a story? How do you define a story? And you can just share them in the chat. It doesn't have to be long answers and there are no wrong answers either. So. And you can take an experience. Does that experience have any defined boundaries or characteristics? Something with a beginning, a middle, and an end? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, not necessarily, though. Communal memory. Yeah. Stories can help us, like, like I mentioned before, with having a common goal, uniting people with their memory and with their actions. That's a really good point. Narrative with a conflict and a resolution. Yeah, if a story doesn't have some sort of complication, it's not very interesting. Sequence of events that start at one point, something with tension or challenge. Yeah, that's a good point and we'll get to that. Theme, plot, purpose, characters, as a purpose, a goal, or a moral. Those are all really great answers. Um, there are no wrong answers and the next slide that i'm going to present is also not going to be you know the comprehensive def definition of a story structure it's just to give you ideas there are countless ways of structuring stories yeah start chronological sometimes it's fun to start at the end and then describe why it happens for sure um some stories don't have any sort of uh, time-based structure like uh, Pulp Fiction. It's a movie that bounces back and forth between the, pre the present, the past, and the future, and all of the sections don't really relate to each other until you get to the really end. So there are so many ways of structuring stories. So I usually like to think of stories as being defined by character, causality, and time. So someone doing something that results in something else happening sometime or somewhere, kind of really vague, but that's really the best way I can think of stories. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have a character in a story, but you don't necessarily need to have it make sense within time. But uh, often stories can be thought of as, you know, beginning, middle, end, establish something, why is it important, pay it off in the end, who, the characters, what, what's happening, where, what's the setting, 
when, what's the setting, why, why is it important today, what makes today special, how, again, what makes today special, why is it important. Character, setting, conflict, like we mentioned before in the chat, things really aren't that interesting unless there are some sort of complications to a story, and so conflict is really important because it can result in climax and resolution. Uh, and my favorite definition probably, someone doing something somewhere and or sometime for some reason. All of these are just, you know, generalities. Uh, there are other story structures like you've mentioned before. If you think of any others, please share them in the chat. Uh, but now is the time where I'm going to be directly uh, citing the creators of South Park in this science communication webinar. And so I don't even remember the names, but the creators of South Park uh, always frame every episode that they make of the show with this and but therefore structure. Think of a story as something that can be progressed with three distinct conjunctions, and, but, and therefore. And is introducing a new element to your story, but is a complication or a contradiction of those previously introduced elements, and therefore is a causal relationship uh, between those previous elements, uh, often looking towards conclusions and results and that sort of thing. So a very simple example is, it's hot out and I want ice cream. And my roommate has some at home, but I am lactose intolerant and I don't have any lactose free ice cream at home. And so therefore, effectively, I have no real options. Therefore, I went to Shoppers Drug Mart, but it was just raw. Therefore, I had to go to the convenience store across the street. But, and, sorry, and they had the ice cream I wanted, but it was more expensive than I was hoping it to be. Therefore, I went home and ate my roommate's ice cream, which was non-dairy, or which was dairy and not non-dairy, and therefore I wasn't feeling good later today. Um, that's a silly example. I could have come up with a better one, but I wanted to make an example about ice cream. Uh, if you wanted to, in the chat, come up with, you know, maybe a three or four part and but therefore story about anything that you want. Uh, it might be a fun little exercise to do right now. It can be silly, it can be um, goofy, it can be, you know, mundane, but, um, you know, just having an idea of how those three conjunctions really help structure and progress the story is, is really good moving forward. And uh, I, I tend to structure a lot of my science communication uh, works, my presentations and acts with and but therefore, being used pretty uh, commonly. Uh, I like it a lot more than um, most other structures, and so that's why I'm including it. If you wanted to share any in the chat, you can. If there aren't any people feeling brave right now, you could think about this later as well, and we could move on. I'll just give you a few seconds while I have a sip of water. Okay, it seems like um, maybe someone will come up with a great end, but therefore story in a little bit, but I'll move on right now. Uh, and will it work? Yes, so we're gonna talk about uh, dramatic structure a little bit more currently. So this is the Freytag pyramid. You're probably familiar with it. Um, it frames stories as following the sort of uh, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution structure, where in the beginning you set up the story with a little bit of exposition, then something uh, incites the story to begin, the complication often results in a climax, uh, and then there's falling action where things fall into place as a result of whatever happened, whether it was a fantastic or horrible climax, if it was the apocalypse or if it was you know, finding utopia, and then often 
resolution and uh, the end. Um, this story structure has been, ooh, I'm seeing some OPP drama in the chat, which is cool. This story structure has been uh, around and talked about as long as Aristotle. Uh, this pyramid also takes its name from Freytag, who also talked about the story structure. Um, so today we're going to be going through two examples of how this could be used with rising action, falling action from Lord of the Rings. Uh, the first is the Fellowship, and then the second is uh, the entire Lord of the Rings. And so really, if you're not familiar with Lord of the Rings, uh, I hope I can communicate as well the way in which the story really follows a lot of succeeding rising action, falling action, rising action, falling action, rising action, falling action uh, structure. And so it really starts out with a birthday party uh, and it leads up to this wonderful birthday party. Bilbo turns in an age that is uncharacteristic of hobbits. Um, and at the, at the climax of the party, he tells everyone off and disappears. And after that, we start of, we begin to follow our protagonist Frodo a bit more. He finds the ring, Gandalf freaks out a little bit, and eventually rising action forms again when Gandalf tasks him with bringing the ring uh, to Rivendell. And so Frodo departs with Sam and then Merry and Pippin a little later on, and rising action happens until Frodo and the hobbits meet Aragorn, and then Frodo is stabbed on Weathertop. After this climax, uh, it seems as though our little hobbit protagonist might die, but he's saved and is brought to Rivendell where the formation of the Fellowship happens, the Fellowship of the Ring, and, you know, and my axe and my sword and my bow and all of that great stuff happens, and then they set off on their quest to destroy the ring. And they reach the mines of Moria where Gimli thinks, oh, my cousins will help us out. But then he finds out that they're all dead and they reach a bunch of orcs and they escape the orcs. And so then there's some falling action again, but then they meet this fire demon, this Balrog. And so then that's more rising action. Then Gandalf sacrifices, him, sacrifices himself and then there's falling action as they escape. But then uh, they meet more orcs and then rising action again as the fellowship starts to become fragmented and then Faramir starts being tempted by the ring and then he dies and then the fellowship disbands and as the story ends uh you know Boromir dies you're right Faramir is his brother wow I can't believe that no one caught me when I was doing the run through of this I should have more Lord of the Rings credit than this but yeah Boromir dies thank you Faramir is at Gondor. Um, he's the unfavorite son. So then the fellowship disbands, you know, everyone goes their separate ways and the story kind of ends there. The whole story can be thought of in like a three act part, again, with each book kind of acting as one of the acts. So the first story, the second story climaxes around the Battle of Helm's Deep. And then the third story has a few more climaxes with these big battles. But between each of these battles, there are falling actions. And as you can see, even after the ring gets destroyed, everyone returns home and returns to their normal lives. It's not as though the story just ends there. There's some resolution. And yeah, story structures like this can be, you know, you can apply the Freytag pyramid to any structure. Any story that's been told, um, often it will fit. Uh, and so moving on, before we start talking about monomyth, um, I'm just curious, does the chat have any thoughts about how the Freytag pyramid might be used to apply to communicating research and science in general? Uh, often, I think maybe that the act of science itself could parallel the Freytag pyramid. And in that way, it may be a good structure for science communication when it comes to research because of those similarities. Uh, if you want to chat about it in the chat for a second, I'll let you be able to share your thoughts before we move on to the monomyth, which is my favorite aspect of storytelling. So if not, that's OK, too. I know it's pretty daunting. 
yeah, because there are many failed experiments before one works. Yeah, and that would easily relate to the concept of uh, complications when it comes to the rising action. Like, you know, maybe you're running out of funding or something, or or you have a short time frame before your samples are gone or die. It seems as though most sciences building reagents and troubleshooting, which fits this action, involves all different people and experiments, a lot of rising action before a big conclusion. Yeah, and after you actually reach that conclusion of, you know, your hypothesis is proven or disproven, it's not as though the story ends there. There's, you know, consequences to a research project. How does it change the field? How does it change the understanding of it? How is it going to be applied if you're doing basic research? Does it have any applied, um, you know, applied usages? All those things. Ooh, we have another and but therefore. There's a dreamy girl and she was quite lovely. Hmm. I mean, there isn't an assumption that you're a scientist. I mean, you are just a science enthusiast, a science communicator. You don't have to uh, necessarily be a scientist. I just uh, framed some of these questions having the assumption that some of the people interested in science communication would be active researchers. But that's definitely not the case. I mean, I'm currently not an active researcher uh, and I am a science communicator, but yeah. Uh, the Lord of the Rings was just to show a little example of a story structure. We're going to go through another example right away as well. Um, so yeah, moving on. This is the monomyth. It is, uh, I think, the most ubiquitous story structure in the world. Um, there's countless examples of it. Alice in Wonderland, The Wizard sort of Oz, Hunger Games. Uh, we're going to go through, I think, the most famous example in a bit, but the structure really acts as a circle where you have a hero living their everyday normal lives in what's comfortable to them, what they know. However, you know, they aren't necessarily completely fulfilled in living with the known. Maybe they have this urge for adventure or this weird inkling for something supernatural or weird and something entices them to explore what might be unknown to them. Often their entry into the unknown is aided by some sort of sage or guardian or uh, keeper or yeah gatekeeper or something like that. But as they make the decision to enter into the unknown, they begin a transformation. And they meet friends along the way, often helpers and a mentor or two, and they start to experience challenges and temptations. Uh, often they are helped to overcome those challenges and temptations by their, their mentor and their friends uh, before they reach a big revelation about the nature of the world, the nature of themselves. Something fundamentally changes at the point at the bottom of the circle, revelation, the abyss, death and rebirth. Uh, and they begin their transformation to a greater extent as they often overcome some sort of great challenge. They atone for something uh, and you know, succeed in the quest, the journey that they had begun. Having completed this quest, they decide they want to return to their everyday, known, comfortable world, but they have changed themselves. So they return to the known, having changed, often with some new insight or skill or quality in them as they return to their normal everyday lives. And this is the monomyth or the hero's journey. It was a story structure that was wrote about in the 1940s by Joseph Campbell. And we're going to talk about Star Wars because it's the most famous and obvious example of the hero's journey. So we have Luke living on a desert planet, everyday life, picking up power converters at Tashi Station, uh, you know, buying droids for his Uncle Owen from some Jawas, drinking blue milk, living in the known, kind of bored, wants to be a pilot. But eventually something entices him to an adventure, to a journey. He finds this message from a princess in some droids that he got from the Jawas. 
And he thinks, oh, Ben Kenobi, Obi-Wan Kenobi, maybe there's a connection there. And so he seeks out his threshold guardian. Sorry about the image. It was supposed to be a GIF, but the GIF isn't working. Uh, and he meets his threshold guardian, Obi-Wan, who introduces him to a world of lightsabers and the Force and Jedi and the Sith and Darth Vader and, and Alderaan and Han Solo and all of these different things. He enters this unknown world, he leaves Tatooine, he leaves his desert planet, and he explores space, he explores the galaxy. Along the way, he meets friends, like I mentioned, Han, Shui, Leia, the droids, and mentors, Yoda, of course. But he faces challenges and temptations. He starts to see the darkness in himself. He starts to see Darth Vader in himself. He starts to question if he's a good person, if he's the right person, if he's a Jedi, truly. And these challenges are tough. He loses a hand. And then it comes to his real revelation, the death and rebirth, that the reason why he's struggling with this darkness is because he is Darth Vader's son. Whoa, crazy. And it's, it's difficult for him. He starts to accept that darkness more too as he starts to transform. He becomes more cocky and arrogant, more um, accepting of his anger and that dark side. But eventually, at the end of the sixth episode of, of uh, Return of the Jedi, uh, he atones for that darkness and not only saves himself, but saves his father too and defeats the evil emperor and finally returns to the known, having changed. He's still drinking blue milk. He's still living in barren, uh, a barren landscape, but he's wiser. He is more skilled. He, in the newer movies, more cynical, but returning to the known, having changed. What's comfortable? And so we're going to talk about how this, the hero's journey can apply to scientists. Uh, so I have two examples, and then I'll put it out to the chat if anyone has any other ideas in the way that this story structure could be applied to scientists and communicating science and conducting scientific research. But the first we'll go over is an undergrad. So the hero's journey of an undergraduate science student. So they're taking an undergraduate class. You know, they're enjoying science, they find it interesting, they're doing okay in their work, but they've never really conducted scientific research before. Science really does seem like a uh, thing that you learn about in class and not a thing that you know, they conduct themselves. But they receive a call to adventure from a supernatural aid. Maybe one professor in particular is very compelling, they're engaging, maybe they're doing research in something that's really intriguing to the student. And so they approach the professor as their threshold guardian and they enter into the world of the unknown, the world of scientific research. And perhaps that professor acts as their supervisor or points them towards a supervisor that uh, maybe is more suited to their interests and they conduct scientific research, but it's not super easy. You have challenges along the way. You have doubts. Maybe I should just go be a doctor instead. I mean, medical school is easier. Most, Medical schools don't even need biochemistry requirements or the MCAT anymore. It's so easy. And of course, failed experiments, so many failed experiments. But eventually they reach a point, a revelation, death and rebirth. They, their hypothesis worked or their experiments were correct. Switch that around. Their hypothesis was correct or their experiments worked. They create new knowledge and they change. They become more confident. and. Uh, they believe in themselves and their ability to conduct research. So they think, I can do this. I can be a scientist. And they gain that confidence. And their atonement often in the world of science is in the form of writing, maybe writing a paper for publication or an uh, honors thesis or a master's thesis. And eventually, uh, you return to your everyday life. I mean, when you're a scientist, you're returning to your everyday life every day. But uh, I think often there is this segmentation between what you do normally and when you're conducting science. So you, you are a scientist, but you're also more as you enter the world with this new perspective on how science is conducted. And not necessarily everyone follows the academic route all the way, but I feel like most science students at some point do uh, dabble in research, and this is one way to think about it. 
We can also think about the professor as a hero in a monomyth story. You know, they have a new research idea, which is their call to adventure. And uh, their threshold guardians in the case are known experts in the field. So they check their publications to make sure no one's doing this research before, before deciding, no, no one is doing this research. So I will enter the unknown and conduct it myself. And maybe finding mentors or helpers, collaboration. I mean, science is so often done now through collaborative work um, and challenges and temptations are the same as the undergrad, you know, failed experiments and doubts, but eventually, oh, it works and I'm right. And the confidence in the professor maybe is a bit different than the undergrad. I bet we can publish in nature. And so that confidence and of course, atonement, writing, similar to the undergraduate structure. This is just one example. Uh, and as they return to the known, to what was comfortable as the project concludes and they are ready to publish, they think, you know, PNAS isn't nature, but it'll do. You know, it's, it's good enough. You know, you know I, I cite a PNS paper in this presentation, so it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, and so, yeah, these are just two ways the hero's journey can be applied to the act of doing science. Uh, of course, it can be applied in so many different ways when you're communicating science and telling stories, not only about conducting science, but about the applications of science, the, the ways in which scientific research changes our lives, changes our policy, all of those different things can also fit within the hero's journey. Uh, I just picked two research oriented ones because it was PNAS is just a uh, it's a journal proceedings of the natural uh, National Academy of Sciences I think can someone can someone cite me can someone fact check me in the chat because I feel like that's totally not right uh, I just I just know it as the acronym but uh, if someone knows the the full name off by heart. Just help me out in the chat there. Yeah. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Thank you, Whitney. Um, if you can think of other ways the hero's journey can be applied to science, uh, please share them in the chat. Okay, I'm getting fact checked. Yeah, okay. Lots of people are fact checking me now. David is. Thank you, David. Uh, yes. Obviously, I have never, uh, yeah. That wasn't a question I was expecting for this presentation, but thank you, chat. Thirds, we're going to talk about thirds now. Many stories work really well when they're segmented into thirds. Think of three act plays. Uh, threes are great for engagement and comedy. You know, you set something up in the first act, you allude to it in the second act, and then you pay it off in the third act. Or you, you tell a joke once, you tell a joke twice, and then the third time you switch it up a bit so it's subverting the expectations of the audience, and then it lands really well and it's really funny. It's an uh, enticing strategy for comedy and storytelling, and there are a lot of different story structures that are based on thirds. Beginning, middle, end, middle, beginning, end, zoom out where you, you start really specific and you see the more broader context with thirds, zoom in where you start really broad and you see more specific and more specific um, storytelling as time progresses, past, present, future. Thirds are really great for storytelling. And my favorite way of using thirds is the Herald. It's an improv format and it's really a third of thirds. So you have three story threads, A, B, and C, and each of them go through three stages of storytelling often with more you know, increasing stakes and complications as time goes on. Uh, and really the best example of a Herald is any Seinfeld episode. And so this is just one example, the marine biologist. Uh, and so there's three story arcs, Kramer, George, and Elaine and Jerry. The third, Elaine and Jerry, is a little less important, but I'm including it because this is one of the most well-known Seinfeld episodes. So, the story starts off with Kramer giving Elaine an electric planner. George somehow lies about his profession to impress a date. He tells, he tells the lie that he's a marine biologist. And Elaine and Jerry find themselves wrap, wrapped up in this sort of screwball uh, 
story where there's this angry Russian author and this woman, and it gets a little hairy. So I'm going to focus more on the first two threads. Um, in the second uh, act, Kramer decides that he wants to golf into the ocean because he wouldn't have to go retrieve the golf balls after. Whereas George goes on the date, protect, keeps up the ruse that he's a marine biologist, and they, off, they go out for dinner or a movie and then go out for a walk on the beach. And then in the third, uh, you know, Elaine and Jerry do something and, and the planner that Kramer gives Elaine ends up getting thrown by the, the author and hits a woman in the head and Jerry's interested in her romantically and uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and it results in some stuff that isn't important, but what is important here is uh, that one of the golf balls that Kramer is golfing out into the ocean ends up plugging a whale's blowhole, and that whale ends up being beached on the same beach that George and his date are going on a nice walk along, and they see the beached whale, and they see the crowd of people, and because George lied about being a marine biologist, he has to go up and inspect this whale that he obviously has no idea how to save and eventually somehow saves the whale's life because he puts his hand in the blowhole and pulls out a golf ball and Kramer realizes what he did and George realizes what happened and Elaine and Jerry realize what happened and it ends really poetically. And so the Herald is one way of structuring uh, thirds in a way that's really interesting. We're going to go over an example of a science communication presentation that I produced using the structure of a herald. It's about fungi research and how fungi help um, degrade uh, deadwood fallen trees in forests. So there are three story threads, establishing fungi, establishing the research, and establishing the human aspect of the research. So the communicator, the scientist who is presenting this presentation, started the story or started the narrative off with um, relating the audience's personal experiences with fungi and deadwood and walking in forests and then established why fungi are important and what makes them so magical and special and then establishing the relationship between the forest and the research and why those two things come together and are really important in the second act um, she introduced herself and why she was suited for the work. She explained the methodology of the research and how it relates to sort of the environment in which she was conducting research and the subject of which she was conducting research on, and then established why work like this hadn't been done in North America up until now. It had been done in Europe, but not in North America, and that's because the scientific context, the, the landscape of the research being done was unique and important and important to the story. Eventually it resulted in two impact results, the societal impact, which included the economic context to why this research was important. Again, taking basic research and showing the applied nature of it. And the climate change context to show the interdisciplinary aspect of this research and how it affects the economic context and that affects society as well. And the other impact was the scientific impact, which this work hadn't been done up until now, and so it expands how fungal community analysis was done. And using thirds, using this weird, silly improv format, it resulted in a really strong and a really interesting uh, storytelling way of doing science communication. And so this is just one way and another way and another way of structuring stories. There are so many other ones as well, and we don't have time to go through all of them, but. Um, those are some examples and you all have favorite stories and all of those stories have structures and applying the structure of those stories is a valid way of conducting science communication if you're thinking about what really works for you and hoping that that will really click with your audience. Everyone has different you know, flavors and tastes and style and, and, and that's really interesting and great and it means that science communication can be this fluid, ever-changing, um, very like but varied uh, field this this medium of of everything just being really unique and that's really awesome I'm getting ahead of myself so um, we're going to talk a little bit about beginning middle and end before we end this presentation 
So for starting out science communication, how do you start? There are many different ways. Um, you could start with exposition, you know, set up the story, give context to what's going on. You know, in a world where there's only one fridge, one man has to take the fridge across the world. Uh, something like that, you know, movie trailers, think about how they set up exposition, that sort of thing. You have to do it in that silly voice though. You know, establishing the who is the story about, what is it about, where does it happen and when does it happen, why is it important? All of those aspects are typically established in the beginning. Um, you can set up elements that will pay off later on in the story. You know, Chekhov's gun, if you introduce a gun in the first act, it has to fire in the third act. I put pipette here because, again, science communication. And tease the ending if you would like. Often, as we'll see, the best endings have elements of the beginning wrapped up into it. If you're really keen and pay a lot of attention, you can often tell the ending of a story based on the way it begins. In the middle, it's all about raising the stakes, which means you're making the audience care. You have to establish urgency or relevance or intrigue. Um, it's really about what makes this day special, what makes this story unique. Uh, and this can be done by introducing twists or complications. The stakes of your story have to be high in order for the climax to pay off. Um, and so the audience needs to care, and the middle is the place to do that. And finally, the end. The ending is often dependent on the beginning and the structure. Here's a picture of an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail, and it's often used, I, I at least like to use it very often as an example of how to end a story. You find the end in the beginning. Um, but the end can come from a lot of different places. It can point towards a potential future or a future that does happen. It can end on a positive note or a negative note. It could be accumulation of events. It can be uh, you know, a twist ending, like M. Night Shyamalan likes to do. There are a lot of different ways to end a story. And so that's the end of the presentation. There was a lot of information today, and I attempted to touch on a lot of different aspects of storytelling and relate them to science communication. Uh, here are some uh, resources that you can look at. Houston, we have a narrative is a book by Randy Olson that's all about using narrative in science communication and science writing. The Here with a Thousand Faces is Joseph Campbell's 1940s, uh, I think it's an essay on the monomyth. There's this PNSA paper all about using storytelling in science communication, which is really good. Dahlstrom, 2014. Uh, Story Collider is a podcast and a live programming uh, production organization that does live science programming. So you can find it on a podcast feed, but they also do shows in Vancouver and Toronto currently. And if you're more interested in improv and how improv skills can be used in storytelling, you can check out uh, Impro for Storytellers by Keith Johnston. Uh, if you're more interested in improv in general, there's a lot of different books you could read and I could suggest, but that's something else. Um, so I'm sure we have a lot of questions. We have about seven minutes. I'm not sure if we can answer a lot of them right now, but you could also send them to me on Twitter at this handle or at the Evidence for Democracy email, and I can answer them after the fact. If I can't answer them, I can point you towards someone who can or a resource that can help you find the answer uh, on your own. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions right now, about storytelling or the presentation or anything that wasn't clear, we could do that in the chat right now. But if you know it starts getting really out of hand, I don't know how much we can actually do, but let's try. We have some time. So yeah, that's a really good question. How can science communication address scale of stakes? Uh, everything is urgent. Audiences become numb to urgency and don't care. Yeah, and that's like a huge problem for climate communication in general, you know, just doom and gloom pervading sort of everything about science communication when it comes to climate change and the environment. Uh, stakes doesn't have to be big. And that's something that might seem weird, but stakes can be 
really small too, right? Like if you're um, telling a story about climate science and you're a researcher that goes up to the high Arctic or something, stakes doesn't necessarily mean, you know, all this ice is going to melt. It could mean we got up there and we thought we had equipment that would work. And all of a sudden, you know, this key piece of equipment broke and we were stuck out there or our, our, our snowmobile broke and we were stranded at this research post for more time. You know, those are ways you can introduce stakes that isn't in a numbing way. And it uh, really progresses the, the stakes of the story without necessarily being the stakes of the research, if that makes sense. Um, stakes can also be like, you know, we're doing this research on this microbe that no one's really looked at before because it was only discovered last month or maybe our lab discovered it. And so it shows this promise of, you know, creating these antimicrobials that might be used uh, clinically. That's also establishing stakes. Um, yeah, stakes can be big, which is important when you're trying to get the urgency of something, but they can be small too. And I think using them uh, together is a great way of making sure that the audience is engaged. It doesn't need to be urgent. It needs to be uh, enticing and exciting, I guess. Story, presentation, lecture, or a written narrative of five minute YouTube. I'm not sure exactly what this question is asking. Uh, I mean, story can be used in any of those contexts. Story can be used in, you know, I know Vine isn't really around anymore, but Vine was a medium that was, uh, you know, constricted to six seconds. You only had six seconds of video to you know, make a joke or tell a story. And people should, people found a way of telling stories in six seconds, structuring stories in a way. And it became this, uh, new, this new style of comedy and this new style of storytelling, but it, it, it still used uh, the same structures and tropes and, and narrative structures as longer stories too. Is the story a play, a movie, or a five-minute soundbite? It's it's anything really. A story could be a single sentence too. Um, yeah, a story can be told in any of the. Yeah, exactly. Um, so story isn't necessarily you know long or written or even structured in any of the structures that we talked about today. It's just, you know, it's, it's one of those things where humans just know what a story is. If that makes sense. We have three minutes left. I'm wondering if there are any other questions. How do you analyze the audience? Yeah, I mean, science communication really is done best when you have a two-way flow of information from the audience and communicator. Uh, that's when it's most effective and that's when it's, uh, you know, most fun. Um, and that is about establishing a, a, a conversation with your audience. You know, a conversation doesn't need to be a literal conversation, but you should be tuned into where your audience is, you know, their, their body language, how vocal they are in response to your story. Are they laughing? Uh, are they paying attention at all? Um, those are ways. Uh, also getting the audience involved in the story itself, asking them questions is a great way of seeing how uh, plugged in they are. Um, and often that is more memorable. If someone's just talking for, you know, an hour straight, it's not as memorable as someone talking for 40 minutes and asking 20 minutes worth of questions to the audience. Yeah. I think I hear Katie coming back on, so. <laughs> yeah, um, we're almost at three o'clock, so I think we will end it there. So I just wanna thank you, Jeremiah, for that really excellent webinar. I know I learned a lot, and I'm sorry that we didn't catch the Lord of the Rings error. Clearly we're not big enough nerds. 
Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you again, Jeremiah, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, this was recorded, so afterwards we'll send you a link to it as well as the slides, so you'll be able to revisit it because it is a pretty heavy um, topic, and I think it's best to be able to have the slides available when you're actually trying to apply these theories to the to your own story that you're trying to tell. Um, so we will be sending that out. So yeah, thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>